Last lecture. It's been a trying semester, but we finally got through it. So for this last discussion, we're going to talk about databases running on sort of new emerging hardware uh, or sort of non-traditional hardware that's slightly different than uh, everything we talked about so far. Before we get into that material, I quickly want to go over what's remaining for you guys uh, in, you know, from now until the end of the semester for final grades. So on Wednesday this week, we'll have a guest speaker from Amazon come give a talk about uh, the things he's been working on at Redshift. So this will be live, this will be on Zoom. It's unfortunately, it's only available for CMU students, so I'll post the details in, in Piazza. On May 4th, next week, you'll have your, uh, the second round of code review submissions. May 5th, you'll do your final presentation, also on Zoom, uh, also only available to CMU students to discuss you know, the, what, what your group has worked on. The final exam that I gave out last week will be due on Wednesday, May 13th. And then uh, what's missing here is, is in the code drop. Uh, that's posted on, on the, the website as well. So when you have to you know, submit all your information to me to say you're actually done uh, after incorporating the, the, the second, code, second round of code review uh, comments. And then on May 16th, on Saturday, we will have our uh, extra credit hackathon. Again, this is optional. This is available to those that, that want to participate. It's actually also going to be uh, open potentially for, for non-CMU students. And so we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to coordinate that. And again, the idea is that you're not going to work on, you know, just keep working on what you worked on for project number three. It would be uh, something new or sort of adding a new like SQL function or new feature uh, to expand the support of, of our SQL uh, system uh, for this. Okay, so again, I'll post details about this on, on Piazza. One additional thing is I need everyone to also fill out the course evaluations at this URL here. Uh, so this is super useful for me because it, you know, I, I realized that the last, you know, last, last half, half of the class of uh, semester has been online only. Um, so just in general comments about the projects, the reading assignments, the general cadence or the pace of the class, those things are actually very, very useful. I actually read them and I actually take into consideration of tweaking the class uh, from one semester to the next. The, uh, the university and the department actually read these things. So this is, don't take this lightly and don't be like most master students often are where they just click five, 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 five for everything. Like actually, you know, if you want to spend time and give me sincere feedback, uh, please do. It's entirely on anonymous. So to give you a kind of idea of feedback that I, I often can get, uh, we got this once a year where people rightly pointed out that I had a body odor problem. This has been since resolved in, in subsequent years with a sort of special shampoo. So hopefully no one has, has been uh, too offended by uh, any odors that my body emits. But again, this is super useful. I didn't really know that I had a body odor issue until this person pointed that out. And then I went to the doctor and he's like, oh yeah, this, you have this problem. It's this medical condition. Here's this special shampoo you should use. So. This is why I want you to be uh, candid and open about all your comments uh, for the course. I, I do take them in consideration. Okay. The, as I said, the thing we want to talk about today is running databases on, on sort of new hardware. Because our, you know, hardware that's not just, you know, CPU and SSDs and, and spinning disk drives. And so this has been a ongoing theme in, in databases for since almost the very beginning where people have always been looking to use uh, specialized hardware or new hardware to make database systems go faster. Um, in, the, in the early days in the 1980s, or late 1970s, there was this movement called, called database machines where the idea was you would buy like an appliance, a specialized uh, server that had custom hardware ASICs to do you know, the database operations. So this common one was that you could buy a database machine that had specialized hardware to do hash joins very efficiently. So this movement sort of fizzled out in the 1980s because, uh, because of Moore's law that you know, Intel and Motorola and, and, and DEC were putting out new CPUs all the time. And so by the time if you were a database machine vendor, by the time you went and you know, designed and fabbed and, and sold your specialized database hardware, 
Intel put out the new version of x86 that got even faster. So it was, uh, you would get diminishing returns on the amount of effort you had to do to, to, to build these things. So in the 1990s, for the most part, everybody was running on uh, commodity hardware. And certainly when the cloud came along in the 2000s, this is even, even more so. In the 2000s, though, there was some early attempts to build FPGA, FPGA databases where the idea was you would have an FPGA sit between the CPU and the disk controller and, or, and you just do push down predicates on that. So Netezza was a famous system that did this. IBM bought them. I think they've sunsetted them or killed them off about a year ago. Um, but they, you know, they, were the, they were the first FPGA database system. And again, there was now also a bunch of appliance databases where unlike a database machine where it had specialized hardware just for the database system, the idea of an appliance was it was commodity hardware, but the system and the, op the operating system, the database system were tuned explicitly for the, for the hardware that it was running on. So you could just buy this one rack unit that had MySQL running on it, but MySQL was already tuned for that exact hardware. So it was sort of achieving the, the best performance. But again, because of the cloud, uh, this sort of fizzled out because everyone just said it's just cheaper to buy, uh, you know, commodity stuff on it from Amazon. In 2010s, uh, there was a, there's been a, the FPGAs have sort of always been there. I think in recent years, they've, they've becoming more prevalent. Um, but the big thing we saw in the 2010s, in the last decade, was the, the rise of GPU databases. And this is where, because of the, the, the big interest in using GPU computing for machine learning, people correctly identify that, oh, I can actually do some database stuff on the GPUs and take advantage of all the advancements that the machine learning guys are, are getting. And so we'll talk about a little, little bit, little bit at, at the end of this lecture, of just what these GPU databases are and what they look like. So now in the current decade that we're dealing with, um, I'm actually very excited because I think that, uh, I think it's gonna be the Wild West again in terms of everybody's gonna be trying everything. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things coming out in hardware that uh, may not be explicitly de designed for database systems, but sort of data intensive applications, if you want to call it that, which includes machine learning or data science things, but databases are, 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 are a key component in that kind of stack. And I think that there'll be some things that we can start incorporating in, in database systems and still have that be considered commodity hardware. So the main thing that we're going to talk about today is persistent memory um, and just sort of how you design a database system to handle this. I think this is going to be a, a major change uh, in this decade. FPGAs and GPUs are still be around. I think that um, there's still gonna be niche players. I don't see, um, I don't see them being like uh, every database system is gonna have to have a GPU or an FPGA uh, sort of accelerator component for it. Um, it's a majority of the databases are gonna run on on database systems are gonna run on, on you know Intel CPUs. Uh, Going beyond FPGAs are these things called configurable spatial accelerators. Think of this as like an FPGA, it's like a programmable um, uh, hardware that instead of doing the, the, sort of the logic that the FPGAs do, it's, it's more of a, a data flow thing. And again, like when I say more, I mean, it's hard to predict what else is gonna come out. Uh, fabbing costs should be going down, um, especially for sort of, maybe like 70 nanometers, like sort of larger size transistors. Uh, so people can start fabbing stuff uh, much more cheaply than, than they've been able to do before. So the economies of scale could sort of help us. So again, we're gonna focus on this today. We'll talk a little bit about GPUs, uh, but I think in the next 10 years, I think a bunch of more things are gonna come out, which are be pretty cool. All okay, right, so as I said, uh, we wanted to spend most of the day talking about persistent memory. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how to accelerate things with, with GPUs, and then we'll finish up talking about uh, hardware transactional memory. Because this one also often comes up with students asking about, oh, you know, is, is this something I could be using instead of having to do all the concurrent or latching stuff that we talked about this semester? And the answer is going to be no. We still need to do everything that we've talked about so far. And this may help in, in small cases. Okay? So, persistent memory. Um, the... Persistent memory, the, the, the way to think about this is that 
you know, when we talk about in the intro class, this, this dichotomy between the volatile and the non-volatile storage and how we had to design our, our, a disk-oriented database system to account for those differences. And certainly last, last class, when we talked about larger than memory databases, we needed to be aware that our database could have been writing out to a, uh, it's writing data to a non-volatile block-based storage device that's much slower. So we have to, you know, design our algorithms and our hierarchy to account for that. With non-volatile memory, or persistent memory, the idea is that we're going to get almost the speed of DRAM and have an access interface that is uh, addressable, byte addressable, like DRAM. But the, the hardware will be able to retain all our reads and writes uh, even after the power is lost. All right, so that's why it's called persistent memory. So I'm going to slip up multiple times during this, uh, during this lecture and keep calling it non-volatile memory because that's what we were calling it when we first started doing this research uh, back in 2013. Uh, the industry has standardized on calling this persistent memory, which I actually agree with is a better term. Sometimes you also see this called storage class memory, but they're all, they all essentially mean the same thing. So the first persistent memory devices that were available, which is sort of confusing uh, because they were like PCI Express cards that were block addressable, even though the storage medium inside of it was the same thing that's going to be in the persistent memory we're going to talk about here. It just provided it through a uh, you know, PCI interface. But the new ones that are actually available now from Intel are going to be byte addressable. So it's going to look and smell exactly like DRAM to your application. Uh, but there's some extra stuff going underneath the covers to make sure that everything is persistent. I have to let the terrier in. So let's talk about the, uh, let's talk about how, how we got where we are. Because to me, this backstory is actually very interesting. And it's sort of part of the reason I got, uh, you know, I spent a few years researching uh, persistent memory in databases uh, with, with my first PhD student. So the if you take, if you're an electrical engineer and you take a you know, fundamental course on, on circuits, uh, they'll describe three types of circuits, right? We'll talk about a capacitor, which was invented back in 1745, right? This is the ability to, to store some, some charge, like a battery. Then later on, the resistor was invented to uh, modify the voltage that's coming in over your circuit. And then a few years later, they developed the, uh, the inductor, which is just a way to convert the, the voltage into, into heat. So uh, after 1831, it was just assumed that these were the, the three fundamental circuits. Right? There couldn't be anything else. Like, like you, and the way to think about this is you can't build any of these other type of circuits uh, using other, sorry, any of these elements using another element. And that's sort of the, the, like an atomic element of, the, of circuitry. So then in 1971, there was a professor, Leon Chua, at, at Berkeley, who was working through some equations, uh, and he, f he did, uh, discovered that there seems to be that there should be a, a fourth type of element, because the way the math worked out is, was that there was like this missing component of the equations that you had to have this other fourth element in order for the math to actually work out correctly. Right? And so he uh, hypothesized that there was a two-terminal device where the resistance of that device depends on the voltage that's applied to it. So it's like a resistor, right? Where you, but the difference is that you can actually change its, its, its resistance depending what voltage you give it. Right? And then when you turn off that voltage, it permanently retains, remembers uh, its last resistive state forever. And so what he hypothesized was that there was this fourth element called the memristor. So he wrote a paper about this in 1971. Uh, it was sort of lost to time because it didn't have a lot of citations. It was very mathematical. Nobody understood it. Um, and it was essentially forgotten. Flash forward now to the early 2000s. And there was this team at HP Labs that was trying to build uh, sort of self... Uh, self-configuring nano devices. And what they were finding in their experiments is that these nano devices would have uh, certain properties that they, did, they couldn't understand why they, were, why they were doing certain things. And in particular, it would be like when you give them a, a voltage, they would change the, 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 
they would change the resistance you were seeing in, in, the, in, in, the, in the circuit they were trying to build. And so they looked and they couldn't figure out what it was and they, they kept looking in the literature and then they just happened to stumble upon the, the 1971 paper from Chua that says that, oh, you know, there's this other fourth type of circuit that, you need, that, that actually could exist, we just don't know how to build it yet. And then they determined that it was actually, that, they, that, that HP Labs actually ended up accidentally building a, a memristor, which is super interesting. And part of the reason why they figured out that what they had built was the same thing as what, what Chu uh, hypothesizes that there's this graph of like the circuit that shows this sort of hysteresis loop. Um, and what they were measuring exactly matched what he proposed or, or, or in his conjecture that this is what it should look like. So then they went back and for this, uh, for this paper they wrote, how we found the missing memristor. They went back and looked at <coughs> the last like 100 years of electrical engineering scientific publications. And they found a bunch of other people reporting the same hysteresis loop in their, in their experiments, but no one could explain what was going on. So people had been stumbling upon the memristor for years and years and years, but nobody actually knew what they were actually building. So HP made this big announcement that they had, they had discovered the memristor, that this is something that uh, they were reliably able to reproduce in the lab and that they think they can actually go ahead and uh, manufacture it. And that this was gonna be a, a major game change in the field of computing. So, so much so that like in 2008, uh, they had this big uh, presentation, I guess at their whatever yearly conference that talked about their, their work on memristors. And you can see here that, I think this came out in 2007. So they discovered it in 2006, proved that it actually was real. 2007, they're at this conference. 2008, they're claimed that the memristors will be development ready. And then in the near future, they were going to claim that memristors were going to replace all DRAM and hard drives and SSDs and transistors. Everything was, were going to be running off memristors. So this was over 10 years ago. <laughs> DRAM's not, not gone. SSDs aren't gone. Spinning these hard drives aren't gone. So what happened? Well, uh, HP, as far as I know, has still not produced a or shipped a memristor product um hp then eventually also split off between like the consumer side and the enterprise side they had this they had this moonshot project called the machine that was going to be run entirely off of memristors as far as i know that has was was canceled and at this point i don't know whether even memristors are going to come out at least from hp so let's talk about other types of persistent memory or let's understand now a little bit about uh, what we're going to be talking about today for Intel's device, um, what the memristor is, what it could have been, and what some future technologies are actually going to look like. So what I'll say too is also like I drank the Kool-Aid from HP, um, although I had no affiliation with them. I thought memristors were a, a big deal and I was really excited and I, I sort of why I went down this path of doing persistent memory research here at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and I was always under the impression that uh, the memristors were always two years later, two or two years away, right? So like every time you, HP had a press conference, every time HP said something publicly, it was always like, it's two years later, it's two, year, two years later. And then you get to the next two years and then come out and say the same thing, it's two years later or two, two years away. So that it, and it never happened. Um, but Intel actually shipped, uh, shipped, shipped a device, which is the first one here, phase change memory, which is pretty exciting. So let's go through each of these one by one. Again, this is not specific to databases, it's just sort of you get an idea about what, what's going on underneath the covers with this technology. So phase change memory, uh, the idea is that you have this uh, storage cell that has two metal electrodes going into it. And what happens is that you put a charge into, uh, uh, in, in, into that, this phase change material uh, that's calcinogenide. And that essentially bakes or cooks the, the, the material to be able to, to change the resistance of the circuit, right? So if you give it a short pulse, then that changes the cell to a zero because that gives you a different resistance. If you change it to a, a long gradual pulse, then that'll change it to uh, a one. And again, I'm showing this heater here. It's not actually 
you know, it's not a little uh, match underneath it, but like underneath the covers, you're giving it either a short charge or, or a faster charge. And that changes it to be one, one, zero, one. So the, the idea of a phase change memory has been around for a while. People have known about them, which is nobody's been able to manufacture them at, at scale. Um, and the Intel Optane uh, DC memory that we'll talk about is, to the best of my knowledge, is actually phase change memory. It's not, they haven't said it publicly, at least I don't think they have, uh, but when the devices first came out, some guy in South Korea took it open, cut it, you know, b busted open the, the device and looked at it under an electron microscope and saw that it actually was uh, doing phase change memory. So there's some downsides of this, uh, you know, because you're actually having to put a charge in here, obviously this will generate some heat. So that prevents you from potentially storing on, on, the, on the, the CPU itself. Um, and I, you know, you can only write to it so many times before it wears out. So, you know, phase change memory is here. It's fast. It exists, uh, and you can buy it at large capacities, but it, you know, it, compared to memristors, I, you know, I thought this was, uh, an inferior technology, but of course this exists. You can buy this today. You can't buy memristors. All right. So memristors are a, uh, so this is sort of confusing. The, the, there's the memristor to the circuit fundamental. Uh, the fundamental circuit element, and then, and that actually includes phase change memory or the spintronics. But then there's like the HP marketing where they would call whatever they were selling the memristor. Uh, but the sort of the the sort of scientific definition of what they had built was called resistive RAM. And the way this works is that you have two layers of uh, titanium dioxide. Um, above uh you have to, uh, to titanium dioxide above two layers of of or in between two layers of platinum and the platinum is gonna 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 carry the charge and what will happen is uh if you uh if you run the charge in one direction you'll change the resistive state if you change the, run the charge in the other direction you change you change the resistive state so the idea is like the the there's floating um uh, electrons in between these two, two different layers, and that's how you said it'd be a zero or a one. So the cool thing about memristors, again, why I was excited about them is like titanium dioxide is a very common element. It's the same stuff that's in white house paint or sunscreen that you put on your face. So it's not like some, uh, you know, some obscure material that you had to manufacture. You know, platinum is obviously not, not super common, but, um, but for titanium dioxide, there's, you know, there's, there's a ton of it. So it was going to be super cheap and actually super uh, uh, high density, you know, petabytes per square centimeter, because the, you know, there's, the, the current you're sending through this is much less than, than the phase change memory to change the state. The other interesting thing that's really wild about uh, memristors or resi res resistive RAM is that HP was talking about how you could use the storage fabric or the storage medium for executable logic. So they talked about how you can actually change the, uh, like, like, like an FPGA, you can load a program onto the, onto the memory uh, and have the, as the data comes out of the memory, uh, it could, would flow through your logic gates and do whatever additional processing that you wanted on them. Right, so you think of like, I can do like in-memory computing. I can do a, a scan on a column and have some executable logic gates to, to apply the filter. And then, and then the cost of changing that executable logic on the fly was super cheap compared to a, uh, an FPGA. So you, you can like load it per query. And so there was all this talk about how they could build neural networks and memristors. They can model the brain uh, with memristors. That was about 10 years ago and I haven't, haven't heard anything about it since then. Uh, <clears throat> the other interesting thing about uh, the executable logic for memory resistors is that it wouldn't use the traditional NAND-based logic that we use <clears throat> in our CPUs that we have now. It would actually use something called material implication, which was invented by the, the great philosopher Bertrand Russell back in like the 1910s. So it was like a completely different way of thinking about computing if you ran on the memristor. But of course, you know, it never happened, right? or it's yet to happen. All right, so 
the way to think about the, the three mediums we're talking about also here as well is like there's the, there's the phase change memory exists now, the mem resistors might be in the near future, and then a little bit farther out will be this magnetic resistant RAM or Spintronics. And for this one, instead of actually storing, uh, instead of actually storing or changing the, the storage medium to, to, to record a charge, uh, we're going to change the, um, we're going to, we're going to, move electrons using magnets, right? So the idea is that this oxide layer is going to move electrons between, between them, and that's how you're going to set them to be, uh, to, you know, set the bit to be zero or one. And then supposedly this not only uses less energy, it a, has a smaller uh, scale factor. So you can, you can store this at like, you can have these be stored at like, 10 nanometers per, per bit. Um, and the speed is almost equivalent to your CPU caches and like using static RAM, SRAM. So you could now replace all your, your L1, L2, L3 caches with Spintronics, have that be super large, because it's a higher capacity, uh, much cheaper to manufacture, sitting on the CPU, and you're, you, know, you basically have persistent L4 with like latencies less than DRAM. So this is super amazing, right? If, if this exists, uh, this, this would be a big game changer. I think for all of these, Actually, I'm not sure what the mem resistor is. But for Spintronics and for phase change memory, prior to them manufacturing like D D you know, DRAM DIM replacements, um, you can buy them in like small scale factors for like for like cell phones and things like that. So you can get, I think now you can get Spintronics DRAM or Sp Spintronics RAM in like 16 megabyte capacities. Certainly not enough for what we need in a database system, but like you know, it does actually exist, just not at, at a large scale. So, why is this for real? So, for three, re so three reasons uh, why you know, persistent memory is actually a thing now we need to consider in our database system. The stars have sort of aligned such that we, we need to be cognizant about, uh, about this technology and actually consider it when we design a new system. So the first is that the industry has agreed upon a standard technology nomenclature uh, and form factor for these devices. So there's this thing called JDEC. It's basically the consortium between a bunch of manufacturers. They said, okay, if we're making uh, non volatile memory, here's what the form factors have to be, right? That's sort of like DRAM, right? You know, there's, there's, you know, there's DRAM 2, 3, and 4, right? That's a consortium that has decided this is what the form factor is, this is what the spec is. And then all the manufacturers can go off, go off and make the same, you know, same, make devices that, that follow this, that specification. The next thing that happened in 2018, 2017 was that both Microsoft and Linux have added support for persistent memory in their kernels. And this is something called DAX, basically direct access extensions. This is, allows us to write programs that are, that are able to use an API where it knows it's talking to persistent memory, right? Like there's basically syscalls that, that we can to, to access this and we, and we have the right instructions we would need to actually make sure things are flush, which is the next one here. So in 2018, 2017, Intel refreshed the uh, instruction set for Xeons and added explicit instructions to do cache line flushes to persistent memory. Again, think about how you write programs now. I, when I do an update to a piece of memory, underneath the covers, that's doing a, a store operation or stored instruction to update that that memory, but I'm that the, my write is going to land in my CPU cache unless I'm doing uh, streaming writes. But for, you know, ignoring that, my write lands in the CPU cache. But if I if if that CPU cache is now going to be backed by persistent memory, like instead of DRAM, it's persistent memory. I mean, a program needs a way to know that the things that I wrote or that are sitting in CPU caches have made it out to uh, has made, has made, actually made it out to, 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 to persistent memory. And therefore I know that my write is durable. When you think of it again, in a disk based system, I can call F sync, right. And that, that, that'll move it out of, of, uh, sort of whatever OS buffers that it has, uh, and actually persist it on disk. And I don't get a, a return call to my application until I know the disk controller says that my write, write was successful. So we need the same thing for our cache lines. Uh, and that, that's what these instructions give us. So 
This is sort of was the state of the world up until 2019, 2018. Uh, but then last year is when this stuff actually became available. So this is what Intel is shipping now. It's called Optane DC, persistent memory. And as you can see, it looks like DRAM. It has a DRAM uh, 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 form factor, meaning it can fit right on where DRAM exists in the motherboard. But instead of being volatile, it's non-volatile storage. Now how this actually works uh, is a bit complicated, but like there's, it's almost like an SSD where there's, there's an, or actually, there's an ASIC on the device that's doing load balancing or, or wear leveling and, and garbage collection and encryption and a bunch of other things. So this is, this is more than just like, hey, I'm just writing this from all bits. This is intercepting the writes and actually doing something. So you, as far as I know, you can't go to Amazon because I tried today. You just can't buy this. This is something you have to get through like a, a manufacturer. So it's still, still not widely prevalent, but it, they're out, they are shipping this. You can get access to this today if you have the money. Uh, Price-wise, I mean, I, I'd have to go look. I, yeah, actually, publicly, I don't think we discussed the prices. Um, I think it's three or four, four times the price of DRAM. We should just look that up. Um, but but it, it exists, which is awesome, right? So so obviously, over time, it'll get cheaper. There may be other manufacturers of this technology. So so this to me, this this is a big deal. All right. So how are we actually going to use this? So from a, from a database perspective, uh, there's, there's really two ways. And as far as I know, um, well, yeah, from, from a database perspective, there's two ways. There's a, th there's, I think there's an additional way to, to configure the, the, configure the, the device, the, the Optane device to do writes a certain way, but we can ignore it. This is what we care about in a database system. So the first is that you just have uh, DRAM being used as, um, as a hardware managed cache. So what does that mean? So this is our persistent memory. Whatever the size of this is, that's what the operating system thinks it has for, for the total amount of memory that's available to the database system. So now as I start doing writes uh, for my database system, it'll go through the VM subsystem. The write will first land in DRAM because that'll be fast. And then I can return back to my application and say, yeah, we got your, we got your write in memory. And then eventually this will get pushed out to, to um, to persistent memory, or if I do a flush, then I make sure that that's actually uh, retained down there. But the idea is that since DRAM is faster than persistent memory, at least as they exist today, I can have all my writes writes absorbed like this, and I don't I don't experience the slowdown necessarily of the of the slower latencies for persistent memory. So in for Intel, they call this memory mode, where again it's just we're just using it as if it was DRAM. And there's actually nothing we're doing in here in our database system with this setup that is aware that we're writing to persistent memory and just thinks that it's just DRAM. It's a larger, cheaper, potentially DRAM. And so that means that we still have to write a log, we still have to do a bunch of, a bunch of extra stuff to account for this. Because again, we think that we're just writing to, uh, to DRAM. The other approach is that we would have the, the, the DRAM adjacent to persistent memory. And now our database system is aware that we're writing to persistent memory and that, that it has the durability properties we want. Um, and so to do this, again, if I have a write, I can, I can declare I want to write it to some region of memory in my address space that is backed by DRAM, or I can have a write go to some region of memory that's backed by persistent memory. And I know that if I do that, write the persistent memory and I do my flushes, then my, my changes are durable. So Intel calls this application mode. Again, the idea here is that the application, meaning our database system, is aware where the boundaries are or that we've allocated some memory into our address space that's, that's in persistent memory versus DRAM and that we, we can do flushes as needed. So, the, as I said in the beginning, these devices first were arrived on uh, PCI Express cards and they were block addressable. So for, from, a, from a database systems perspective, that's not interesting because that's just, we just take our disk uh design choices we made from la last semester and build a system to use that. It just looks like a faster, uh, faster SSD. And actually when we did benchmarking against some high-end Samsung devices, we really didn't see a major difference in performance for the PCI Express uh, version. 
Uh, you just you saw way more stable latencies though. Like there was less oscillation in, in, in performance. The one, the, the, the setup that we do care about is the, the second one I showed in the last slide, the application mode, where I know I'm writing to DRAM and I know I'm writing to, to persistent memory. And my data system can manage that, right? So, because now we have to go and design our system to account for that, that now I can actually do byte addressable updates to some location of memory, some data structure, or some table heap that will be guaranteed to be, be durable. And then Intel's device handles the, you know, handles the case where even if I restart my application or restart my system, I come back and I can get access to my memory that, that I had before. It's not going to restart the program counters for you. So it's not like you can magically pull the plug and come back and everything's exactly the way it was before. We still have to do some potentially some recovery work because we're going to, our process is going to, is going to start up all over again. So this is a conjecture of mine. I still think it's true. Um, We'll see how it plays out in the marketplace in, in the next couple of years. But I believe that when persistent memory com becomes more widely available, and that basically means like Amazon will give you access to it uh, on, e on EC2, the, the in-memory database systems that we've been talking about this semester, they will be in a better position to accommodate the byte addressable persistent memory um, because they've already written an entire architecture to assume they can do random access very quickly to, to, to storage. The this one in data systems will, will, will probably end up starting with the second approach I showed before where you just have the DRAM sit in front and a persistent memory is a cheaper, uh, more efficient memory pool or larger capacity you know, memory address space. So you don't have to rewrite any of your application, you just, you're just using more DRAM. But then if you start want to be taking want to take advantage of the persistent properties of DRAM or of, of persistent memory, then you have to go and re-architect your system to potentially use a, a byte addressable API. Essentially all the things that we talked about this, this entire semester. All right, so I want to first talk about uh, some storage and recovery methods for persistent memory. Um, and this is sort of just gets you to think about what can what can change if you design your system to account for, to be aware of that you're writing to uh, uh, byte addressable persistent memory. So this is the paper that my PhD student Joy Ruraj and I wrote a few years ago um, on can, can think, looking at all the different, so basic designs you have of a database system storage architecture and what can change with, with persistent memory. So the, back in 2015, we actually did not have the device. The only, what we were using at the time was a hardware emulator that Intel provided us in, in Hillsborough, Oregon, where they've modified the, 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 the motherboard for, for these devices, for the, for, the, for the system, to introduce some additional microcode in like debug hooks for the Xeon so that anytime I did a load in the store, it was basically this, this sophisticated busy loop that would figure out the timings for how to slow down the, the those load and store operations to mimic the behavior of of uh, persistent memory when it actually uh, when it finally came along. So this work was all done in a prototype data system we were building called NStore. This is the first one of the first data systems we were building at, at Carnegie Mellon when I started. Uh, this is actually what the Peloton project came out of. So we started building NStore for this paper. The project kind of got, uh, got bigger and bigger. We renamed it to Peloton, and then we eventually killed off Peloton, and that became the, the tier database system that you, that you guys are working on today. We threw away all the Peloton code and started over. So this is, you know, from, from NStore to Peloton to Terrier. That's how we ended up with this. But there's nothing in our current system that uses any of the, the code we use, we generate for, for NStore, because a lot of it was, was specific to the Intel uh, emulator device. And it was also before Intel put, up, put out a bunch of libraries to do memory allocation and other things you would need to, to, to write persistent memory programs. Nowadays, all that stuff exists like with um, uh, the, the PMDK from Intel. Like they provide you with all the, the important constructs that we had to roll our own back, back, back then. All right, so let's understand how we're gonna do synchronization uh, with uh, persistent memory. So again, the way we write programs now, when you, you allocate malloc a bunch of memory, you do a bunch of writes to it, you assume that it's volatile, uh, and you also assume that it's gonna land in your GPU caches. If the program crashes, you lose everything. 
But now, since we, since we want to be able to write data uh, durably and have it backed by persistent memory, we need to know how that actually works at a high level. So again, say our pipeline looks like this. This is our process that's running on the CPU. They do a store operation to update some location of memory. Well, that store operation is always going to land again in our CPU cache, right? Because that, that, that's the fastest uh, storage medium that's available to the CPU. But then now, if I want to make sure that um, my data, my change makes it out, out to, uh, to persistent memory, I could just wait uh, and hope that eventually it makes it out. Because again, when my, what will happen is if my cache gets full, the, the, the CPU will then write it back, write the change you actually made out to, out to memory, right? And then, you know, then fetch in the next piece that it actually needs into the CPU cache to make space. But I, when I, I, but I, I can't, I need to know exactly when that occurs. Right? There's no callback method for this when it happens, right? That would be too slow. So I want to tell the data, I want to tell the CPU, hey, write this out for me. So we can use a cache line write back uh, instruction that then pushes the, the change to a memory controller. And this is sitting on the motherboard that has a small capacitor to keep it, essentially it's battery backed. Uh, so the capacitor is sized such that if I lose power, there's enough energy in here to make sure that everything actually makes it out to, uh, to my persistent memory. And then at this point, I'll return control back to the program because my write made it out to the memory controller and it's responsible for making sure it makes it up from the other side. And then this thing does what's called an asynchronous data refresh. It's a special uh, instruction inside, inside it for Intel that will persist the changes to the, to, to the, to the non-volatile memory or the, the PM device. So from our database systems perspective, we just need to be aware of what cache lines, or sorry, what memory locations we modify that we then want to make durable. And we use a cache line, flush or cache line write back instruction to make sure that happens. The next thing we have to deal with is if our database system restarts and we come back online, we have a bunch of pointers now to uh, tuples or other in-memory data structures that we have. But how do we actually make sure that those pointers are, are still valid the second time we come around? Because I can't guarantee that when I start allocating memory that uh, the, the first time, that I'm, when I allocate it the second time my, my program starts, I'm going to get the same virtual memory addresses that, that I had before. Right, so the issue is this. I have an index. It has a bunch of pointers to some tuples. Uh, and then let's say if I'm doing a pen only, uh, uh, I'm doing multi-version concurrent control. So I have multiple versions of the tuple. And this in my, in my version chain, I have a pointer to another tuple here. But now if this, if my system crashes, this gets blown away, right? And my index gets blown away. All the pointers are now invalid. What I want to be able to do is come back online and have all my pointers still be valid. So, that, so if I'm using you know, virtual memory addresses, there's no guarantee to do that. So what you essentially need is, is a, a memory allocator that is aware of, uh, of these two issues, that you need to be able to synchronize your data out the disk, or sorry, out the persistent memory when you call the right instructions. And then uh, when I come back the second time, that all my addresses uh, still point to the, the, the correct, correct memory, correct, correct locations in virtual memory. So for the first one, again, you're just doing the, the cache line flush, but then you have an, an S fence to, to wait until, essentially a barrier in the instruction pipeline to make sure that those changes get flushed before you start executing the next instructions. It's, a, it's sort of the same thing as F sync going to the, the OS and not returning until the, the disk controller confirms the, the flush. For naming, the idea is that the memory allocator can, you can declare specialized pointers that come through the memory allocator that are backed by persistent memory and that you know that anytime you have a pointer to that memory location for your application when you come back around the second time you, when you restart the program, those pointers will still be valid for your application. And so you don't want to write all the stuff yourself. You want to use PMDK from Intel to, and they provide you the low level primitives to, to do this. All right, so let's see now how we can use these, these primitives to build a database system. So again, for this paper, what we did was we looked at the three basic design architectures you can have for a storage manager in a database system. And we identified where are the, the bottlenecks or what are the issues for when you're running on, on persistent memory. 
and how can we redesign them to be aware that I can now write changes that, that, that are durable. So for this one, we're gonna assume that, uh, for simplicity, that there's no DRAM, that everything's in persistent memory, and therefore, if I do the flushes, then, then I'll, I can guarantee that my changes are, are durable. So this way to think about this, this is like, you know, maybe 15 years, 20 years in the future where DRAM goes away and does, everything is, is just durable. So the first choice to do in-place updates, this is where you have a table heap plus a right head log snapshots. Uh, and this, for our example, we're gonna base, base our design on, on VoltDB. The uh, next approach is to do copy on write uh, updates. And this is just like shadow copying uh, or shadow paging where every single time I'm gonna update a page, I make a copy of it in a, in a side, side location. And then when my transaction commits, I just flip a pointer to say, here's, here's the, you know, here's the here's the latest version of, of of the database. So for this one, you're making extra copies of the table, but it doesn't require you to have a, a write ahead log for for durability. And so our design here would be representative of something like LMDB, which uses this approach. The last one is a log structured system where you don't have a table heap. The log is the database, uh, and we just keep appending to the log to do fast writes. So this would be something like LevelDB or or, or RocksDB. So we're gonna go through each of these designs one by one. And again, the idea is that take the textbook implementation of these architectures, run it on persistent memory, identify where the bottlenecks are or where the, uh, where, where the redundant updates are, are, and then redesign the architecture to, to account for persistent memory. So again, for the first one, if we have an in-place engine, the way we do writes is that we follow an index that lands to this tuple here, and then we go ahead and update it and to make sure when a transaction commits that everything's durable, we're gonna write out a delta record uh, of the change that was made to, 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 to the write ahead log, and then uh, apply our change here, and then some, some later point, we, uh, when we take a snapshot, then we make sure that our change, uh, our change gets persisted there. So for this one, we're gonna update the tuple uh, sort of logically once. It's like one update query we're applying for this one tuple, but we end up writing it out three times because we have to write out the, the tuple delta, we have to write out the actual tuple in the heap, and then we'll write it out to any additional snapshots that we take. So again, all this is running in persistent memory. Uh, so everything here is considered durable. And so we have a bunch of duplicate data here because again, for the same update, we write it three times. This is also gonna have a uh, slow latency now because I have to do traditional Aries in my in my, my database system where I load the last successful snapshot or checkpoint and then replay the log uh, with with the you know analyze, redo, and undo phases. But again, everything is persistent, everything is already durable anyway, so I may not necessarily need need to do all of that. So we can see how we actually want to design a system to account for the fact that we have persistent memory um, and use the fact that we have just pointers, that we have pointers that can be guaranteed to be correct the second time you run our system to now only record what was changed rather than how it got changed. So to do this, we're gonna, we still have to maintain a transient undo log in case our transaction aborts while, while the system is online and we have to roll things back. And we just make sure that uh, any changes we make from a, uh, we have to count for this because there's any change that we can't, we can't guarantee that the, the, the CPU will flush out any dirty changes to tuples that are sitting in the CPU cache out to, to memory because that's something beyond the control. We can't tell the, the CPU not to do that. It just does it on its own. So we need to account for that. But we know that once our, our, our data is durable uh, in our, our tuple, then we don't need to maintain the redo log for that. Because, or so the tuple is durable out on di or out in the table heap in, in persistent memory, we don't need to redo anything. So let's, let's look, at, look at it like this. So our, we follow the index, everything's in persistent memory. We get to this tuple here. We apply the, before we apply the update, we can now put a, uh, an entry in our log that says, here's the pointers to the tuples that got modified, but that's all you need, need, need to know about it. And then I can actually now apply my change. And then 
if I now, you know, flush this, then I know that uh, the change for this transaction is durable, right? This is just sort of helping me to say, oh, by the way, here's what actually got changed in case I need to follow pointers and undo things. But once this change is flushed, along with any other changes for it have flushed, my transaction is considered durable. All right, so let's see how we do a copy and write engine. Um, for this, again, so this is a hierarchical version of shadow paging. I'm just using a, a B plus tree. And the way to think about it is that we still have the master record that points to you know, the, the master copy or the shadow copy, and we do compare and swap to flip that. But our, uh, our pages are just laid out in, in a hierarchy in, in a tree. So let's say I want to update this tuple here. So I would first make a copy of the of that page and then the 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 entry in the tree on the side here then update my directory to now point to uh for the second page we still point to the original one for the new page over here i point to the new one so I, that's another write to to my to my entry to my my my, my structure and then i do a third write now to flip the master record to the uh to the to the dirty record so the first issue with this is that we're gonna do this, these copies are expensive because again we're taking this entire page even though we only update uh, you know one tuple inside of it we have to make an entire copy we have to update the the leaf information update the dirt directory just to retain this and so what we can do because persistent memory is we can treat it like DRAM instead of having a page oriented architecture it can be a byte addressable architecture like we have now uh, where we just have pointers to tuples. And then now when I do an update, I only have to copy pointers uh, over here as well as applying the change. And then I update the dirty directory and, and, the, and, and the, uh, the master record. So the key difference here is that the, the granularity of the change we're making because we can read and write to uh, byte addressable locations in memory is, is much smaller. All right, the last one is a log structure architecture. Again, the idea here is that uh, sort of classic architecture you would have is you have an in-memory mem table with a write-ahead log and a, a skip list or some kind of small data structure to keep track of what log entries are, are in memory. And then you have on, on disk, you have a bunch of SS tables that always have a balloon footer in front of it and then an index that points to uh, locations in the log. So. When I want to update, I first apply it to my delta of the change I made to the right head log. And then at some later point, I'll, I'll flush that out the disk. And if I'm doing compaction now, I'm going to keep, uh, have write amplification where I'm keep applying changes or com combining log records over and over again if, if they have to be retained. So the issue with this is that we have duplicate data. And because if we're, if we're using a leveled architecture, we're going to have uh, the expense of compactions. So if you want to switch this to persistent memory, then we can get rid of the, uh, the, the SS table entirely because now all of this is persistent. And therefore, we can just have the write-ahead log uh, and our data structure for that, and we don't need to do any, any of this. We still have to do compactions, though. Uh, that, I think that doesn't go away. But uh, we don't have to have this, you know, this concept of a mem table and an SS table, which are different, different sort of layouts of, of the data. In all the examples we just looked at, uh, as I said, those were assuming that the computer we were running on only had persistent memory and there was no DRAM. But I guess that's not really going to be realistic for a while. So let's think about how we actually would design a system today using what uh, is available uh, from Intel now. So let's target a way to speed up performance uh, and take advantage of persistent memory by focusing on the on how to sort of take a standard table heap plus write ahead log implementation and speed that up. So what is the write ahead log doing for us? Well in a either for a in memory system or a disk oriented system, the idea is that we're trying to avoid random writes to disk by replacing them with sequential log writes. For an in-memory database, we only do uh, sequential log writes because we're writing to the table heap in memory. For a disk oriented system we do our write sequentially to, to the log, and then eventually in the background, we'll flush out dirty pages. So that's one advantage we'll get. The other one is that we'll also get um, uh, transaction capabilities 
because now if there are changes that are hanging out in on disk from a transaction that hasn't that did not commit before uh, there was a crash before the system shut down we can use the the log as a way to roll them back and reverse any of their changes so again this design of a write ahead log of sort of writing to the tuple first then writing to uh to the uh sorry writing to the log first before you, we write to the tuple makes sense because again the the, the log write is going to be sequential in a persistent memory world though we're going to have fast random writes right we, byte addressable implies that we can jump to any location in the persistent memory space and that will have the access speed that's um almost equivalent to uh, doing sequential access. So the huge dichotomy or the the difference in performance we had in a sequential write versus a random write in a spinning disk hard drive or even SSD is going to be much less in a in a persistent memory system. So we want to design now a logging protocol potentially that can take advantage of this. And the way we're going to do this is that uh, the, way, the way we're going to do this is maintain a multi-version database and do copy on writes uh, or make sure we don't overwrite ex existing versions and then we'll have in our log just the metadata about what was committed rather than the actual copies of the changes that were made so this is the technique uh, that my PhD student developed here at Carnegie Mellon called write behind logging and the idea here is that it's a logging protocol that's designed specifically for persistent memory, but in a world that still has DRAM uh, for, for the table. And the idea is that we can get instant recovery of the database after a crash with minimal amount of redundant information being stored in the log. And, and the, so the way we're going to do this is that we only have the... Uh, that we have a copy of the, of the database in persistent memory. We make sure that we flush changes to that database. And now our log is only going to change, contain pointers to the records that got changed. And then now after a crash, all the thing we need to do is just look in the log to figure out what transactions are running at the time uh, of the crash or the, or, the, or, the, or the shutdown. And we would have pointers to the tuples that they modified. And, we, and then we keep track of the fact that the the updates that these transactions made did not commit, and therefore we know the pointers to those tuples, and then we, therefore we, we want to we reverse them if anybody tries to access them. So another way to think about this is like, we, unlike in a write-ahead log, we don't need any redo information because the changes that our transactions made are, are made durable to persistent memory right away, and we never have to worry about reapplying them from, from the log. So, the um, now in the context of persistent memory, this protocol is new. There was one other system that we're aware of uh, that did something sort of similar to this, um, and this was brought to our attention by the great Phil Bernstein, sort of the the, the godfather of sort of modern concurrent control. Um, and he told us of a database for a I think it was a it was a Puerto Rican uh, telephone company back in the 1970s. So at the time, Puerto Rico had bad power infrastructure and they would lose power several times during the day. So they had to have a database that could run that could come back instantaneously anytime there was a, there was a power loss. Because if you're shutting, having these abrupt shutdowns multiple times during the day, and if, you're, if your recovery time is super long, then uh, you know, it would, by the time it took you to go recover the database, the power might, might get shut off again and you're, you're, just, you're never able to keep up. So they had a, a database that sort of did something like this. Obviously, it wasn't with persistent, modern persistent memory, um, but it was, it was making copies of the database, just paying the penalty of doing random, uh, random writes to disk in exchange for uh, faster recovery times. But most modern systems don't, don't make that choice. And in our case here, with right behind logging, we'll be able to get good, good performance at runtime and good recovery time. So again, conceptually, our setup is like this. We have a table heap. So if you want to run this query, it's going to update a tuple. So the table heap will, will, will hang out in memory, in DRAM. And then there'll be a second copy on persistent memory. And then we'll have our, our log on persistent memory as well. So now when we do an update, uh, we first update the, the, the tuple in table heap, then write the change to, sorry, in memory, then we write the change to, to MVM. But then we also now just write some metadata to the log to say, 
oh, by the way, here's the pointer to the tuple in persistent memory that changed. So that we know if we crash before our transaction commits, we can use this to figure out where do we need to go and make sure that those changes aren't persisted and when the system restarts. So how this is all gonna work is that we're gonna rely on multi-versioning and we're gonna assign transactions timestamps just as we normally would. And when we go to flush out changes for transactions, the, we're gonna figure out what is the range of transactions, uh, in-flight transactions that are running right now and just record that in our write-ahead log or as a write-behind log along with pointers to the, to the tuples that they're modifying. And that tells us what, what are the potential range of tuples, range of transactions that should not be persisted after a crash. So now, when after a crash we come back, again, we use this uh, failed group commit range to identify what tuples are, no, are not valid. So we don't have to look at individual timestamps. We just look at, does the, is the tuple I'm looking at have a timestamp that f falls in this range? And therefore, I know it comes from a failed transaction and I can ignore it. And so what you're essentially getting is like the, you're getting the undo operation sort of for free as you're normally doing the visibility checks for multi-version concurrent control. So it'll, it'll make more sense, more sense in, the, in the next couple of slides. So when I recover, I only have an analyze phase. The analyze phase looks through the right behind log and says, here's all the, here's all the timestamps of the transactions that, that, could, that didn't commit successfully. Then I immediately start processing transactions, but now I've computed this global range that says, here's the, uh, here's the range of transactions that if you come across a, a tuple that was modified or created by them, a version that was created by them, you know we should, we should ignore it and then reclaim the space. So you're sort of doing like, like cooperative garbage collection uh, as you're going along and identifying tuples that, that shouldn't exist. So let's look at an example. So say here that this is our timeline of going forward in time and we're to keep track of as transactions get started and, and when they commit. So T1 starts here. So for the current range of actual transactions, we know it's between T1 and T2, right? And there's no failed transactions because hey, this, this is the first time we turn it on the system. So let's say now here, before T1 commits, we crash. So then well, when we come back, T, say the next transaction that starts is T2. And so the only thing that we needed to do after the crash is when we scan the log, we would find an entry here to say we, the last range that we knew about from the last group commit was between T1 and T2. So now the, the range, current range of actual transactions is T2 to T, T2 to T3. So now as T2 runs and, uh, and accesses the database, if it comes across anything that was created by T1, it knows that it should be garbage collected and cleaned up. So it, uh, it go ahead and just start clean, you know, removing those things. Say T2 commits, but then T3 starts, same thing, our active transaction is T3 to T4. And we, since we know the pointers of the tuples that T1 modified, we would know whether we've cleaned up everything that T1 uh, has touched yet. And let's say in this case here, we don't have a transaction that touches what T1 and T2 does. So we could run the background vacuum in a separate thread just to scan through and find all those things and reverse them. So that way we're not stuck with, with versions that nobody are accessing and it's wasting space, right? And then T4 starts. And at this point here, we know that we've gotten everything that T1, uh, T1 modified. So we can then remove it from our list of failed ranges. So I'm gonna show you now the performance of what right, right behind logging can do, but I'm gonna do it the opposite of what we normally discuss, how we normally discuss things with transactions. I'm gonna show you the recovery time first. Right? Normally you show performance first before recovery. So this one, it's running, uh, uh, replaying a right behind log, a right behind log and a right ahead log of 1 million TPCC transactions. And this is running on that Intel emulator that I mentioned where you could tune the, uh, the latency of persistent memory relative to, to DRAM. So in this case, we, in this case here, we're making the, the speed 2x the latency. So, and also to the, the, the latency here was symmetrical. So the read and write costs were, were the same and the sequential and random writes were the, uh, sequential, the sequential and random accesses were the same cost. And then the reads and the write costs were the same as well. But in real hardware, the reads are going to be faster than, than the writes. So we're going to compare uh, the, the time it takes to restart the system and recover the log, put the database back to a correct state for a spinning disk hard drive, a solid state uh, flash drive, and the persistent memory emulator. So what you see is that with write ahead log, the performance of the different approaches are 
roughly the same, right? Because this can be the cost of, or this is also on log scale, but it's the, co you know, it's the cost of accessing disk and then replaying the log. Um, the combination of the two of them are, are, are about the same. The difference though now with right ahead logging, the uh, recovery time is a thousand X faster because all you do when you turn the system on is you just check to see that right, get the, the, the failed timestamps from the right behind log. And that's all you need to do to, to say, I'm now my database is, has been fully recovered, at least at a logical level. So what this is showing you is that the performance benefit of right behind logging for persistent memory, as well as the older storage devices is about the same. It's about a thousand X. So now you look at this and say, well, sure, right behind logging is faster than right ahead logging, but why do I have to do this in persistent memory? Because I'm getting amazing performance, of, or, sorry, amazing recovery time for these other storage devices as well. Well, now if we go look at, at the runtime performance, now you see a big difference. So for the runtime performance of the right, or the right ahead log, you see that, of course, as you add, uh, as you have a faster storage device, you, you're gonna get better performance. So persistent memory is faster than the solid state drive or the spinning hard drive, right? And that's the bottleneck of when you commit transactions, at least in this case here for TPCC. So that's why the persistent, uh, the, the persistent memory gets the best performance for right ahead logging. But now if you do right behind logging, now you see why you, you need persistent memory. Because in the case of the spinning disk hard drive and the solid state drive, you get a 10, 10x reduction in the runtime performance when you use right behind logging. But only if you use persistent memory, you're gonna get a 1.2x uh, speed up in performance. And this is because in, with the persistent, uh, right behind logging with persistent memory, because you have flat, fast random writes to the table heap on persistent memory, you know, that's random IO, which is gonna be terrible on, on, the, on, on these, on these types of slower devices. So this is the combination of right behind logging uh, and persistent memory is the, is the right combination is to get the best performance in this scenario here. Okay, so just to summarize what we talked about. Um, we talked about how to, if you, if you know you have persistent memory that's byte addressable, you can reorganize your storage architecture to take advantage of that and reduce the amount of data duplication and redundant copies of, of, of data during uh, update transactions. And then we saw in the case of, uh, of, of the right behind logging is a technique that allowed you to get better recovery time because you're, again, you're taking advantage of the fact that you know that you have a protocol that's writing to persistent memory and therefore you can set yourself up, the system up, so that upon recovery, you have to do minimum amount of work to put the database back into the correct state. So as I said, I think for persistent memory, um, this hardware is available now, and I, you know, once it becomes more prevalent and more commoditized, uh, you're going to see a lot of database systems coming out to take, take advantage of this. In the very beginning, they're all just going to use it as larger, cheaper memory that's a little bit slower. Um, and some systems will, systems will be more sensitive than that. But if the, you know, but the prognostications about the limitations of scaling DRAM, uh, you know, if those turn out to be true, then the, you know, everyone could be switching over to something that le looks like an Optane, uh, Optane DIM. Okay, so now I wanna finish up talking about uh, some, some, some computational uh, acceleration we can do in our databases. And explicitly, I wanna talk about uh, GPUs. Um, as I said, for FPGAs, they're used in, um, they're becoming a little bit more common now, um, sort of because you can get them on Amazon, uh, you can get EC2 instances with them. But it, as far as I know, there's more GPU databases uh, around today than there are FPGA databases. And I think partly is that because the overhead or the sort of engineering cost of writing FPGA code versus writing GPU code or just using a, a GPU library, like the stuff that NVIDIA provides, like that's a much, the bar of entry to get advantage of new hardware or, or, or sort of non-traditional hardware in your database system is lower with GPUs than FPGAs. Okay, so if you wanna use a G GPU in our database, what do we need to know about? Well, we need to know about what, what GPUs are good for. Well, GPUs are gonna contain uh, thousands of cores and, but the, 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 the type of computation or the programs that those, uh, cores can, can execute 
are going have to be less sophisticated and less complex than what you would normally run on a full-fledged Xeon core. And this is because these cores are designed to do relatively simple operations, again, relative to what Xeon can support, on uh, that are repetitive on large amounts of data data streams, right? So you, like you, you want to be able to say like the best case scenario would be like doing a sequential scan on a bunch of columns or, or a single column broken up into different chunks and you can blast that out across all the cores and all the cores are doing the same thing and there's no um there's no uh indirection there's no uh conditional branches it just says i'm going to from beginning to end i'm going to apply the same filter and over and over again so again as, this is basically what i was just saying but like the kind of things we want to push down to the GPU or, or anything that don't require uh, additional input to make decisions about what to do next or require you to, the, the, the program to, to do branches, like if clauses, things like that. So what's really good for it? Sequential scans. What's really bad for it? B plus trees, right? Because that's like looking at the, the contents of, of a B plus tree node and making a decision of where to go. Now, there are uh, proposals in, in the research literature to build like B plus trees or other tree based data structures that you can run on GPUs. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, nobody's actually using them yet. Um, and again, this is not my area of research, so I, I don't know what the limitations of them are, but for the most part, people aren't doing transactions on, people aren't doing transactions on GPUs. They're primarily being used for, uh, for OLAP workloads. The other important thing that we, we need to be mindful about is that Although GPUs are going to have a lot of memory now, uh, it's not going to be cache coherent with the CPU. So that means that if you want to do, um, if, if, you, if, your, if your database is being updated and, and it exists up in DRAM or even in an SSD, you either need to copy the whole thing down to the GPU with all the updates or do like a merge operation to apply those changes incrementally. But it's not like if I have, um, you know, I have my database in DRAM, and I do an update there, the GPU is not gonna magically see that change. We have to explicitly send a message down to say, Here, here's the new data. So again, the idea is here is that we wanna figure out what computation we can offload to, to the GPU, and it's gonna be mostly sequential scans. There are, uh, there are implementations for pretty much, I think all uh, relational algebra operators we would wanna execute in, in a, in, in, you know, to run queries. Um, but sequential scans are the sweet spot. Like there's hash rate implementations, there's sorting algorithms, obviously, uh, that again you know, are designed to avoid these conditionals and branching. So the high-level architecture would look like this. So say that this is this is what we've been talking about the entire semester so far. That there we have a CPU or a multi-socket system, and then we have our database hanging out in DRAM, and we can be aware of the NUMA regions to recognize what you know what what DIMMs are closer closest to a given core. And so over here now in, in the PCI Express bus is going to be our GPUs. And we can just sort of think of them as just another, uh, another socket that has way more cores that, that look a lot different. And they have their own, their own DRAM as well. And they're not going to be in, in sync. Right, so I think like for, for GPUs in 2020, I think you can get ones with maybe up to 100 gigs of DRAM. Um, like obviously on the high-end ones. Whereas like on the CPU, we can get, I think up to 48 terabytes of, of DRAM if we have a lot of money. So the other thing we need to be mindful to is the, the bandwidth between uh, our compute and storage. So to go between uh, DRAM and, and, the, and the CPU core with DDR4, we can do about 40 gigabytes per second. Over the PCIe, PCIe bus, uh, the best I think we can do now is, is 16 gigabytes per second. So it's, you know, it's not that far off. It's not like an order of magnitude, but it's still you know, significantly slower than what we can do over here. So that means that we, that's the, the, one of the challenges we're going to face is that if to run a query, we have to send a bunch of data down here and then be able to crunch it and get it back. Then that's going to be, it may just be faster just to run it up, up here uh, with the, with the, the, a CPU. We're not going to have as many cores, but this bandwidth is going to be our bottleneck for us. So now NVIDIA has this thing called NVLink that, that gives you 25 gigabytes per second in between, um, in between two different GPUs. So you, you could you know, do message passing in between them. Um, you can also get NVLink to go from the, the, the DRAM memory 
up into the, the, C the CPU's memory at 25 gigabytes per second. Uh, that though is this NVLink technology, as far as I know, is only available on power PC machines. I don't think it's on x86. So you have to run on IBM power in order to get, to get advantage of this. I think Intel has its own fabric, but I, I forget what it's called. Or AMD might have something as well. Okay, so how would we organize our system? So there's three different approaches we can take to how we want to use a GPU in our database system. So the first is that the easiest way is just take our entire database and plop it down or copy it down to the, to the PCIe bus, put it on the GPU, and now all the queries only have to touch data that's down on, on the GPU. Um, this obviously is, is limited to the, the amount of VRAM that's available in the GPU. If your database exceeds that size, then this won't work. Maybe you could, you, you could daisy chain a bunch of GPUs together and have the CPU coordinate about what, who has what data and combine the results up in the CPU across the different GPUs. Um, but to best my knowledge, I don't think any of the major vendors do this anymore. So this is actually what OmniSci used to do when it was called MapD, and they've since re-architected it to, to do uh, the, the third one here. So the second approach is that you recognize that you're... That for some queries or some, some databases, you don't, maybe don't need all the columns for a, a, a table down in the GPU. So you only copy down the parts of them. Again, now your query planner can recognize, all right, for this part of the query, I can run on the GPU because those columns are down, down in the GPU. But then I'll get back some offsets and I'll you know, copy the, 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 the tuples, a bit, uh, copy the values that are needed for those tuples based on those offsets for the other columns that are up in my memory, and then I just materialize results and, and, and return them back to, to the application. So for this one, uh, where I've seen this done is usually requires the administrator to identify that these should be the GPU resident columns and these should be up in the CPU. And you know that has limitations because people may not always know how to pick uh, the, what, the, what the right approach is. There may be some other systems that can, can figure that out. Uh, for you automatically now. The best approach though is to do um, support streaming algorithms where I can have the data system on the fly move data from the CPU memory down to the GPU memory uh, and process it incrementally while I'm continuing to send down more, you know, I send down the, send down the first batch of data, the GPU fires up and starts crunching on it and then in the background I now start streaming down the sort of the next wave of data that I'm going to need, and so by the time that they finish, the GP finishes processing the first batch, the second batch is ready to go, and it just keeps on going. So like the, the, the GPU is always being always being fully utilized, and there's hash join, there's sort merge join, there's there's a bunch of different algorithms that that can there's implementations of algorithms that that can can do that for you. So hardware accelerated databases were something that I was very interested in a few years ago. We end up having a, uh, a seminar series at CMU on, on this very topic. So I invited most of these vendors over here, the uh, OmniSci, when they're called MapD, Connecticut, Blazing DB, Scream, Brightlight, Aries DBs from Uber, uh, that, was, that came out after we had the seminar series. But the point I'm trying to make is that if you're really interested in this topic and want to learn more, uh, you can go to this URL here and I have a whole, I think there's eight, eight different, uh, eight or seven or eight different lectures or talks from all these major database vendors that, that are building GPU databases, and they'll tell you, uh, you know, what makes them interesting and how they work. But the last thing I want to talk about is hardware transactional memory. So every year I debate whether I want to bring this up because um, it keeps getting turned off by Intel because of security leaks. Um, so the, the way you think about hardware transactional memory is that think of like you have a critical section uh, in your code. And now I can have a heart or transaction managed by the CPU that keeps track of the loads and store operations into memory for, for, for my transaction. And then if I now, if it determines that there's a, that there was another thread that running also a transaction that maybe read or modified the same things I, I touched, then it, it'll can go ahead and abort me and restart me. So the way it works is it basically operates like OCC and it'll maintain a read write set in a private workspace for your transaction, and then when you go and go ahead and commit, they check to see whether they do a validation to see whether anybody else has modified the same locations that I read or wrote. Um, and 
it's kind of cool because the way it basically works is that they just piggyback off of the uh, the cache coherency protocol it's using anyway to keep track of, to keep the cores in sync. And there's using that to figure out when there's conflicts between uh, transactions running at, at different cores. So the, uh, so for this is, this was, this was actually invented by Maurice Hurley. He, who, uh, the guy that invented linearizability. He used to be a professor here at CMU, but now he's at professor at Brown. He invented this, I think in the early 1990s and actually Intel put it in their hardware I think starting in, they announced it in 2012 and then it came out in 2013. Um, but then they found a bug in it in 2014. So then they disabled it. And then I think in like 2017, they're like, all right, here's the new CPUs, the bug is fixed. Go ahead and re-enable it. And then in 2019, I think there's another, I think it's called Zombie Bomb or something like that. There's, so there's another bug that can have security leaks when, when you use this. So this is what I'm saying. So like, I would be kind of want to teach this and show this and have you guys use this, but like, I, it's unclear whether that, you know, this is actually like, you could actually use it today safely on, on, you know, modern, modern, uh, Intel CPUs. Um, I, I don't know if AMD has, has similar issues. So everything I already said, like, uh, the, the way it works is that you keep track of the read, write set. Oh, the read, write set has to fit in your L1 cache. So you can't use this for, uh, you wouldn't be able to use this for like, you know, to replace the transactional stuff that we talked about for concurrent control. Right, because a lot of times your transaction rewrite set will be larger than L1. Um, and certainly if you have multiple threads running at the same time, you'd be thrashing L1 and, and you, know, you would have problems with this. So the reason why we might want to use this also too is like the, um, this is not just for performance. Uh, this is also useful from a software engineering standpoint. Because now, instead of doing all the latching, crabbing stuff that we talked about before, you could use this as an alternative uh, and maybe get the same performance of having software-managed latches or software-managed transactions uh, with lower engineering overhead. That's purely conjecture. I don't know whether that's actually true, but that's sort of been what the proponents of this, of this technique have, have argued. So let's see how you would actually want to use this. So with hardware transactional memory, there's, there's two programming models that, that you can use. The first is called hardware lock elision. And the way this works is that I start my transaction and anytime I, I do a write during my transaction, I don't actually do it. Uh, I just, you know, I sort of like do a Jedi mind trick. I, trick, I, I sort of trick myself thinking that I, that I did do it. Um, and what will happen is like, so, so if I write to a memory location, it's hanging out in my private workspace. If other threads try to read, um, read that memory location, they won't see my write. And then when I go to do a com uh, commit, the, the hardware will check to see whether there's a conflict with other transactions or other threads. If there wasn't, then I can go ahead and apply my changes from the private workspace into sort of a global memory. If there was a conflict, then the, the hardware will roll back, roll me back to the starting point of my transaction, almost like a stored procedure, you roll back to its beginning and then re-execute it but now when I execute it the second time, I'm actually going to take explicit locks to protect the memory regions that, that I'm writing to. And so that way I, I, you know, I'm guaranteed that uh, I, I can run with that without conflicts. So it's like, again, it's optimistic first. And then if I get it, if, 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 my, if I conflict with somebody else, then it gets restarted with, with the pessimistic locking. The other, it's a more complicated approach is, is to use RTM for restricted transaction memory. And with this one, it's like the hardware lock elision where I'm gonna run the first time without taking locks. Um, but then if there's a conflict, instead of going back and running the transaction again with the taking explicit locks, you, you provide it with a pointer to, uh, to another location in the code to jump to that will do something different than just the regular code. So you still abort the transaction and you roll it back, but you don't jump back to the starting point of the transaction and run it again, you jump to some other memory location for the program that can do something slightly different. So this requires more engineering effort uh, on, the, on our side as the, the data system developer to be mindful that we're jumping to another location and, you know, and have sort of a, an alternative implementation of the critical section that we're trying to protect. So let's look at an example of how we could use it. So say that we want to do, uh, we have a B plus tree and we want, we want to insert into key uh, 25. 
So if we're just doing the latch crabbing that we talked about before, the op optimistic latch crabbing, I would take reed latches till I get down to here um, and then recognize that this is the thing I want to modify. So I take a right latch, or that's, that's an X for exclusive, which should be a right. And then uh, when I have that, I can go ahead and apply my change. But now if I'm doing this with hardware transactional memory, my program would look like this. I would have the boundary from where my transaction starts and when I, when I commit. And for this critical section here, this is just the crabbing portion where I'm traversing down into the, uh, traversing down into to the, the tree till I get to this F node and I can take the exclusive latch on the, on the, or the right latch on F. So from the outside, it, it looks like that I've magically made it through down here transactionally and this would automatically detect whether somebody else took a, the latch at the same time I would. And so from the outside, it just looks like that I'm magically warped down here. I took the correct latches all the way, so I'm guaranteeing the, the integrity of the data structure in terms of what, what, what the, the, pointers, the, the pointers are pointing to. Um, but I didn't have to I didn't have to, have to um, you know, actually apply these rights uh, to, you know, to, to in memory all that got elided and I could jump down here and get it and do and get exactly what I want. Okay. So to finish up, um, the, as I said, we spent most of the time talking today talking about persistent memory because, uh, it is my opinion that is out now and that when it becomes more widespread, that this is going to be a major change, uh, in how we build software and especially database systems. Like I could foresee that if persistent memory, uh, takes off as much as I, I think it should or, and, and will, then it may be the case that we don't, you know, in the introduction database class, we don't spend time talking about things like buffer pools uh, and, you know, how to do right head logging with, with sequential I, you know, maximizing sequential IO and things like that. Um, think, you know, now memory is just persistent and I can write to it. I make sure I flush it. I have to order my writes a little bit, but like I don't have to do all that page latching and all that crap we did in, in the introduction class. So, it's my conjecture also, as I said earlier, that I think the in-memory databases are in a better position to take advantage of persistent memory because they're already written to assume that they're, they, they can talk to uh, byte addressable memory and, and not deal with pages. So I think that the conversion from a DRAM or in-memory system to a persistent memory system will be lower for in-memory databases. I also think that uh, the you know, GPU has been around for a while. The FPGA has been around for a while, but you know, like I said, there's not most databases are not most database systems are not being written assuming you have that hardware. Um, it's still, in my opinion, uh, it's sort of a niche, uh, you know, a niche market. The what could happen though is that beyond GPUs and FPGAs, you may start seeing additional computational devices uh, like configurable spatial accelerators something that looks like a TPU uh, or, you know, some kind of custom ASIC that could make a big, you know, big difference in the performance of the databases. The only thing though would have to have to overlap pretty heavily with, you know, potentially machine learning or, or data science applications more than just, you know, doing sequential scans, which data science machine learning do do a lot of, but there's a way for a data set to take advantage of them. I think that would be interesting. Um, as I've sort of also on another side too, I. I think matrix databases will have, um, could potentially become more important in the next decade. And in that case, you know, the, the, some of the accelerators that are out there that are doing computational or, or machine learning on matrices, you know, those databases could, could easily take advantage of those things. But the, core, the, the, the important thing though is like the core ideas of the things that we talked about this semester, and certainly many of the algorithms will still be the same. A, a sequential scan is a sequential scan. Right, evaluating a predicate, you know, cogening that, or you know, or, or traversing the tree, that is all pretty much still going to be the same. And so we just got to think about how we, you know, taking the knowledge we know about how to build a, build a, a data system in the way that we talked about in this class, and apply it to this new hardware. Um, and so I think you have the background to do this now. Okay, so uh, this is the last lecture. On Wednesday, we're having again the guest speaker from Amazon, but that will be cl uh, closed off to only. CMU students. So if you're watching this from outside of CMU, I um, hope you're safe. I hope everything's doing okay. And you know, hope that you're watching this well after we pass the, the pandemic. If you made it through the entire semester watching the YouTube videos, uh, then congrats. Um, so what, what, what should you be able to do now? Well, 
after going through 25, 26 lectures, you should now be able to understand and comprehend and reason about the major topics that we talked about and on how to build a modern single node database finance system. And I'm qualifying what I'm saying by single node because going distributed brings up a whole other uh, bunch of issues with networking and distributed transactions that we haven't talked about. But at a high level, there, there are many of the same issues that we talked about here, where we care about placement, we care about partitioning, we care about join algorithms, we care about transactions, all in that environment. It's just the, the communication is slower and more unreliable, so we have, to, we have to account for that. I also hope that you now have the reason about, to the ability, the foundation, to now reason about the claims that people will make about their database management systems and you'll be able to figure out whether those claims are, are real or whether they're actually you know, plausible or whether it's just a bunch of a marketing hype. Because databases, the database market is a lot of money. Uh, there's a lot of startups. There's a lot of big companies who, who want to make money. And sometimes they'll say things that, uh, you know, unless you're sort of paying attention, you're like, oh, that seems kind of cool. But if you, if you now using the the... The knowledge you gain by going through this course, now you should be able to like look at this, oh, you know, is this real or not, right? So I don't, I don't mean to pick on these guys, uh, but let me give one example that came up last week. So th there's this new startup called Terminus DB, and they posted on Hacker News, hey, we, we've come out, we, we're around, you know, th this is what we do. Um, so it's a graph database, and so they're comparing themselves against a bunch of other, uh, uh, other sort of systems in, in the same space. And they have this little blip here, though, that talks about their features that they do, they do AI co-generation. And rightfully so, you see this and like, well, what does that mean? And sure enough, somebody posted on Hacker News saying, hey, look, AI co-generation, what the is that? What, what are you actually claiming? And then these are some of their, uh, some of the developers are like, oh yeah, this is, this is incorrect. This is marketing gone wrong. So if you're just a casual person looking at this and go, AI, AI co-generation, well, wow, that sounds kind of cool. What could that be? But for you guys who have gone through this course, you know what cogeneration is. You know there's no AI aspect really to it because you're taking a query plan that the optimizer spits out that you know, there's, and that it's only really going to have one way to execute it uh, in, in terms of how you're going to generate the code for it. Um, and so there's nothing AI to this. So again, this is just sort of something I'm hoping you guys can now do on, on your own. See things that people are saying and use your background you've gotten from this course to decide whether, whether they're saying things that are plausible. Okay, so again, next class, we'll have the guest speaker from Amazon, um, and then for everyone else, uh, take care. Bank it in the side pocket. What is this? Some old bullshit. Hey, yo, hey, yo. What? Took a sip and had to spit, cause I ain't with that beer called the O.E. Cause I'm O.G. Ice Cube, down with the S.T.I. You looked and it was gone. Grab me a 40, just to get my buzz on. I needed just a little more kick Hooked like a fish after just one sip Yo. Put it to my lips and ripped the top off They ball just dropped up The same eyes hopped off And my hood won't be the same After Ice Cube take a same eye to the brain yeah.